I get a lot of questions about how to select the right model. When I'm delivering my trainings or I'm preparing my courses, this is an important topic that we go through when discussing how to build with large language models. And I often have these conversations with developers and founders because it's an important question. And it's important because you want to find the right model to experiment with. Evaluation is already very difficult and time consuming. In my opinion, in order to get the right answer to this, it is always going to be about experimenting on your own. There's no like secret recipe out there where you can just go and it will just tell you what model to use based on some requirement. What is often the case is that you do a lot of experimentation with different models, but you need a sort of framework to be able to pick the right model for your use case. And so what I came across is this interesting guide. Well, it's an official guide from OpenAI. How to select the right model. It is their models, but I think there's something here that we can learn from that can transfer to other LLM providers as well, or if you're using other models out there. What I want to do in this video, I want to go through this official guide from OpenAI on how to select the right model and have a bit of discussion on some key points that I mentioned here. I'm also going to be sharing some insights and some of my own experience on how I go about selecting the right model for my use case. What I mentioned here is choosing the right model, whether GPT-4.0, which is their most powerful model, or a smaller option like GPT-4.0 Mini, requires balancing accuracy, latency, and cost. So you always hear about these three, and often enough, you will be making decisions about which model to use based on these aspects. Now again, what you will see here is a framework. It turns out that this works really great for OpenAI models, and I can attest to that because we heavily use the OpenAI models, and we follow a very similar framework. Now, this framework might not apply to every model or LLM provider out there, but I think there's something that we can learn and something that we can transfer and apply and adopt to other LLM providers and language models and even use cases. So let's get right into it. So at the core, you'll be doing two things to properly select a model. So you're going to be optimizing for accuracy first. That's the first step. Again, this is why I refer to it as a framework. And then you're optimizing for cost and latency second. Again, the first one in summary will be to optimize for accuracy until you hit your accuracy target. You always have an accuracy target, right? And how they discuss this is you have maybe some target on cost, maybe you have an accuracy target and so on. And then eventually what you want to do is as a second step is you want to maintain that accuracy, but you also want to make it cheaper. You want to make it faster. And the only way to get it cheaper and faster is by potentially using a smaller model, which in this case, as you can see here, it will be something like GPT-4 Mini. But there are other ways how you can achieve this. This is just one way. All right, so let's focus on the first part here. So it says, begin by setting a clear accuracy goal for a use case. This is no different from any machine learning project. When you're clear on the accuracy, that would be good enough. For this use case, you can go to production. That's the goal at the end of the day. And so here are the steps that you will be typically going through. So you have this accuracy target. As an example, they say 90% of customer service calls needs to be triaged correctly at the first interaction. Then you develop an evaluation data set. This in itself will encompass a huge amount of effort. If you have developed machine learning models and machine learning applications in the past, it's no different with LLMs. It just becomes more difficult and a lot more work. But again, this is assuming that you already have knowledge of that. This is more showing you the high-level framework. So you can create a data set that allows you to measure the model performance against these goals. To extend the example above, capture 100 interaction examples where we have what the user asked for, what the LLM triaged them to, what the correct triage should be, and whether this was correct or not. And I really love seeing this explanation because this is exactly what we do in our course when we talk about prompt engineering. Let's say we were working on like a chatbot system and we have the prompt itself where we prompt the model. Then we have this response that we get from the model. We have the desired response that we want, which is the ground truth, and then an extra label whether this is correct or not. This is basically what they're doing here. And it's more for this triaging use case of customer service calls. The third point here is using the most powerful model to optimize. You want to start off with the most powerful model. In OpenAI case, it is GPT-4.0. A lot of people don't even know this, but you should be experimenting with the most capable model at the beginning. It might save you a lot of time on how to optimize your prompts. 
it may save you a lot of time on deciding whether these models even make any sense from these LLM providers. So I think it's an important decision, it's an important step in this framework especially this first part where you're focusing on accuracy first. So start with the most capable model available to achieve your accuracy targets, log all responses so we can use them for distillation. This right here is super key. And this is why I tell people prompt engineering makes a lot of sense. It's not going away anytime soon. I'm not making a case for prompt engineering in this video board, but I'm mentioning it because it's part of the development process of building LLM applications. In fact, when you're doing this prompt engineering, you're doing a lot of experimentation and evaluation on those prompts. And so when you're testing the model with different prompts and you're gathering these responses, you're essentially building out a data set. You may be doing something like Fuchsia prompting, which they do mention here in a bit. All those examples that you're putting together or exemplars in this case, well, those are going to serve not only for improving on the tasks that you have, you can gain insights as well as you try to patch and solve some issues that the model is facing. But eventually you can take all these examples, let's say you have hundreds of them, and then fine tune a model. And this is what they're referring to as distillation of a smaller model. So it says here, use your trivial augmented generation to optimize for accuracy. And this depends because you don't always need RAG, but it is often the case that RAG is pretty useful, not only for when you want recent events, it's actually really useful as a system to improve the quality of your responses because you're giving the model more relevant context. So RAG can be used for many different things. And then it says here, use fine tuning to optimize for consistency and behavior. So there's a lot of ways of how fine tuning is being used. But one of the ways that you can use fine tuning is in this framework is to optimize for refining outputs, for instance. Maybe fine tuning a model also to structure the output in the format that you want. That's really hard to do with these models out of the box. So it makes sense to do some fine tuning. You know, those responses that you're getting might not be in the style that you want or the tone. You would use fine tuning for that. And I often find that fine tuning is very helpful for those use cases, not only for the OpenAI models, but also for other providers as well. This is a really important advice. So it says during this process, collect prompt and completion peers for using evaluations, few short learning or fine tuning. This practice known as prompt baking helps you produce high quality examples for future use. You can see that there refer to it as prompt baking, prompting the model, optimizing your model, getting these responses and logging everything, making sure to log everything that you're doing. And for this case, you may need some kind of experiment management tool, or if you're logging things into a database, make sure you have that. Don't just experiment and not save the results that you're getting out of those experiments. Those might be actually useful later down the road. Then set a realistic accuracy target. We're still in the first part. It says calculate a realistic accuracy target by evaluating the financial impact of model decisions. For example, in a fake news classification scenario. So correctly classified news, if the model classifies it correctly, it saves you the cost of a human reviewing it. Let's assume something like $50. Incorrectly classified news, if it falsely classifies a safe article or misses a fake news article, it may trigger a review process and possible complaint, which might cost us $300. So it says our news classification example will need 85.8 accuracy to cover costs. This is regarding this specific scenario, but you may have completely different targets for your own scenario. So targeting 90% or more ensures an overall return on investment. And you can see here, this is more objective because now you have all these measurements that you have done, like this is going to cost $50, this is going to cost $300. And so we need to have at least 90 in order for us to get a return on the investment. So use these calculations to set an effective accuracy target based on your specific cost structures. So it will vary depending on your resources. So again, what we're trying to do is trying to figure out whether the decision that a mall is making, how it is going to financially impact us. We have to have an idea of this before even starting to invest time and resources into these projects. And again, no different from classical machine learning projects. It's the same here. And you're just being more objective, which I really like from this suggestion. The second part here, which is I think the more important one, is optimizing cost and latency. So once you have a really good target, right, and it's more objective, then the next part is what are the kind of optimizations and efficiencies that I can get with these models? And what are the models that I'm going to use? So it says here, cost and latency are considered secondary because if the model can't hit your accuracy target, then these concerns are moot, right? They don't matter. So this is why we have that first part 
where you're selecting the best model, running those experiments, have that eval data set, and now you're being more objective in the work that you're doing. You don't have vague calculations. You don't make assumptions about whether you're getting a return on the investment, whether the models that you're using make sense for your use case. Now you have a framework. Says whoever, once you've got a model that works for your use case, you can take one of the two approaches. Compare with a small model, zero or few shot. So swap out the model for a smaller, cheaper one and test whether it maintains accuracy at a lower cost on latency point. So initially we started out with this big model. Now we swap it out for a smaller model. So with the OpenAI models, it would be something like GPT-40 mini. So smaller models are becoming a thing. And this is the reason why. And they mentioned here zero or few shot. That's really important, right? That's what you want to be experimenting with. It says model distillation fine-tune a smaller model using the data gathered during accuracy optimization. So in that first step, we were putting together that data. This is why I said you don't throw away that data. In fact, it makes sense to be logging that information, as I mentioned with some experiment management tool or whatever you have in place. So either of these approaches would work. And then it says here, cost and latency are typically interconnected. Reducing tokens and requests generally leads to faster processing. That's correct. The main strategies to consider here are reduce requests limit the number of necessary requests to complete tasks. I see developers make a lot of mistakes around this. You know, these models are quite powerful and you can use them to achieve a lot of different tasks. It really helps to think about the tasks that the model is performing, breaking down the task, potentially even running experiments separately with different prompts. But in the end, what you are doing is you're trying to figure out whether that model makes sense for your use case, because now you have tested on different subtasks. And what you can do towards the end is put all of that together. And now you have one prompt that achieve all tasks. And so you're not making multiple requests to the model. This is an important one. So minimize tokens. Lower the number of input tokens and optimize for shorter model outputs. As we know, these models, they tend to be very verbose. So by default, they will generate a lot of tokens and that's not good. And so what you will do is you will use methods to limit the length of the outputs. You can do this in many different ways. I noticed that structure outputs or the structured output feature from OpenAI works really great for this because you only get the JSON output. You don't get all that additional context and explanation. That's one way. There are other methods where you explicitly in the prompt tell it to minimize the length. So instead of generating paragraphs, you would generate a couple of paragraphs as an example, or even like sentences. Although the model cannot do this reliably, it's still an effective way to shorten the outputs that you're getting. Essentially, you don't need to output a lot of tokens for a model to be accurate. In fact, it's gonna make more mistakes if it's generating way too many tokens. So it avoids also a confusion. And then it says here, select a smaller model. So use models that balance reduced cost and latency when maintain accuracy. So this is the point that they were making about using some smaller model as well to reduce the cost. Okay, so there are some exceptions here. And they mentioned that clear exceptions exist for these principles. If your use case is extremely cost or latency sensitive, establish thresholds for these metrics before beginning your testing. Then remove the models that exceed those considerations. Once benchmarks are set, these guidelines will help you refine model accuracy within your constraints. There are use cases, again, that will have some kind of high latency, but in that case, you will set your threshold, what is acceptable. And then filter out the models that don't meet that latency requirement. But again, this is being done after you have already run that first set of experiments. So here's a practical example to demonstrate these principles. They developed this fake news classifier with the following target metrics. And you can actually use like these classifiers as examples to test whether this framework works for your models and your LLM provider. So I like the fact that they give you an example like this. You can literally go and put together a very simple classifier example. We have done that in our courses. And this is why we use the classifier example because it's easy to put together examples, not a lot of work but at least you get to apply the framework. And it says here, the accuracy, achieve 90% correct classification, cost, spend less than $5 per 1,000 articles, latency, maintain processing time under two seconds per article. Then in the experiments, they achieve the following goals. So zero shot, use GPT-40 with a basic prompt for 1,000 records, but missed accuracy target. So you can see here the zero shot, 84.5. Remember our accuracy is 90%. And that was based on the financial implications. And then few shot learning, and this is few shot prompting, included five few shot examples, meaning the accuracy target, but exceeding cost due to more prompt tokens. You can see here in the table, you have the accuracy, but you also have the cost. And this doesn't meet the cost target because few shop prompts use demonstrations and use up a lot of tokens. But it's not every use case. Some use cases like smaller text classification problems don't often use too many tokens, but this is something to keep in mind as well. And this is something you'll be measuring. And then they also have latency here. So it says fine-tune model, fine-tune model, GPT-40 mini. So fine-tuning this specific model. We have a video on that. If you're interested, I'm gonna link it in the description with 1000 label examples 
balance meeting all targets with similar latency and accuracy but significantly lower costs so you can see here this is good accuracy so we have hit our target we meet the cost target as well this is awesome because it's much cheaper and in fact this is what i tell people often it is the case that a fine-tuned model would be much cheaper because you don't include all of those examples in your prompt and so if you have hundreds of examples in your prompt in your few shot prompt then you know, fine tune model will always be something that will probably reduce the cost significantly. And then here, the average latency is being satisfied as well. So you can see here how we went from like this first part where we have these accuracy targets, we have done a little bit of evaluation, put together an evaluation data set. We have this realistic accuracy target as well that is based on the financial impact of those model decisions. That's really important. And then how do you, as a second part, then how do we optimize the cost and latency, right? We want to consider maybe model distillation, or maybe we use the zero or a few shot using a smaller model. And so this is how you go about testing with these models. And again, keep in mind here that the model distillation is in most cases going to give you very good performance. So that's expected. And this is something that you want to experiment with. You don't want to leave this out. Okay, let's say in a scenario where in the few shot example or few shot prompting, you know, with a smaller model is giving you really Really good performance and you think that satisfies pretty much your goal but fine-tuning a model on that will even reduce potentially the cost further and in some cases potentially even increase the performance so this is why it's important to have a baseline and to have a way to compare and you can see here that this particular one where we use few shot is pretty much the same accuracy as this fine-tuned model you see here same accuracy but where we're getting significant savings is on the cost here and that might be quite impactful for your company so this is why it's important to show the experiments and the different comparisons that you're getting with the different experiments and solutions that you're trying out so in conclusion by switching from GPT-40 to GPT-40 Mini with fine tuning, we achieve equivalent performance for less than 2% of the cost using only 1,000 label examples. Having a good framework will allow you to unlock not only the capabilities of the model, but also give you a way to more objectively test with these models and select the right model for your use case. So I really love this guide from OpenAI. Thank you to the team for putting this together. I found it this morning and I just wanted to go through it in this video. Hopefully this was useful. Let me know what are your thoughts if this is something that you are already applying and what are your findings as well generally speaking this is what works best for us with the open models so i think there's a lot of value in this 